Hey y'all, John Breen here. Welcome to the Breen Machine Automation blog. I was recently invited to speak for the BadgerBots, the local high school robotics team. And so we had a great time. We, had, we talked about engineering and entrepreneurship, and I just wanted to share it with you. So check it out. Here it is. Uh, um, I'm an engineer, I'm an entrepreneur, I own Green Machine Automation Services. Krista has been with me since the beginning, and uh, she does everything. She does, well, everything other than uh, engineering, accounting, and management. And so, anyway, I, I may be asking her to help if you guys have questions. This is an opportunity. What's it like to be a woman in engineering? I can't answer that. She's in the field. Uh, what's it like to be in the military in the field or funding for school that way? Uh, I will turn those questions to her. Um, so now I kind of want to get to know you guys a little bit. Which, what grades do we have here? Senior. Senior? Senior? Junior? Junior. Junior. Who's it? Seventh grade. Okay. Do we have anybody younger than seventh grade? Super senior? <laughs> cool. So, uh, Chris and I sat down and tried to guess what uh, people in your age range might be interested in that we can share with you. And we came up with a list. So, I'm looking to see how interested you guys are in hearing about these things, and I can talk about other stuff as well. And hopefully, we'll just focus on the things you care about. You guys care about college prep, seniors, juniors, choosing a university or a program, where I want to be when I grow up, okay? Uh, what about finding your first job in engineering? Are, are we generally going for engineering here? We got biology or? Yeah, I'm going for more of a mechanical engineering. Program. Mechanical, okay. Thanks. Engineering, not sure what? Engineering, yeah, something in that realm. Cool. Something uh, making awesome machines to save the world. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about early career? Right? Transitioning out of academia into the real world, I found to be a step. Um, that's a good thing. Cool. Um, I can also tell you what I do in my job. Uh, I'm very passionate about what I do. I, I don't have a huge long portion here prepared for it, but maybe that's a good thing. And then. Are you guys interested in entrepreneurship and starting a business? Uh, awesome. <laughs> Anything else you'd like me to try and include? Uh, do you have specific questions? Otherwise, you can just interrupt me or whatever. Where did you start? Where did I start what? I guess start at the beginning. Where did you begin to try to think, I want to go into engineering? That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. I remember. From a very young age, people were telling me, oh, you're uh, mechanically inclined, you're a tinkerer, you're going to be an engineer or an architect. So uh, from grade school, at least, I didn't know what kind of engineer. And when it was time to pick a program, I obsessed over what kind a lot. I like chemistry. I like physics. I like mechanical things. I like electrical things. Do I want to be an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer or whatever? Um, in the end, I think I picked the program that was the most important from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I went into a manufacturing engineering and that's stuff. And that's basically a mechanical program with a little more focus on processes, how we make things, with a little bit of control theory and programming. And I supplemented that with a, with a computer science program, so I did a lot of work on the side as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lots of thought process for many years, uh, kind of ending up in a, I'll pick the best thing I can. Oh, cool. Um, before we get into anything specific, I want to talk about mindset. This is changing. Our world is changing. How technology 
evolves, is changing. It used to be, you know, you could be a blacksmith, and the guy who taught you how to be a blacksmith has been doing it for 50 years and hasn't changed. And it hasn't changed since his mentor did. Yeah. It's not the case anymore. So yeah, some specific examples of how things are changing. Uh, I was talking to Max, and apparently this is still maybe a little bit relevant. When I was in grade school, third grade, all my teachers were telling me, you got to know your times tables. You want to be an engineer? Because we were talking about it. you got to know your times tables. And I was bad at times tables. I'll just be honest. Uh, so I did my best, and I never got good at them. And uh, teachers said, you're not going to have a calculator with you everywhere you go. Well, they were pretty bad at predicting that. <laughs> <laughs> I always have at least one, I usually have two or three, and they do a lot more than just time tables, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when I'm doing my job, there's a ton of math going on on the computer. I don't even know about it most of the time. You know, we, we have evolved our technology beyond having to do time tables. Um, so rather than memorizing things, and I've spoken with some retired engineers that like know what the square root of two is out to 12 decimal places, you know, we don't have to remember that anymore. In fact, it's probably counterproductive to spend time on that. Um, instead of memorizing, we're looking things up. And it used to be back in the days of blacksmith or whatever, the person who's done it the most probably has the most specific knowledge, probably has his process refined the most, He's probably the best guy for the job. Nowadays, who's got the most flexible mind? How quickly can you learn the next thing? How quickly can you apply what you just learned? Can you be creative with it? And I imagine all everybody in this room, you guys are here as part of, you know, first robotics challenge, or uh, was it tech, tech challenge? Is it just robotic challenge in here? It's different levels: FPC, FLO, FPC, stuff like that. The whole group, you guys are actively learning and applying what you're doing. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Don't lose that. That is what the world is becoming. That, that is market. So, college preparation. Everybody has their own things that they'll tell you to do, and many of them are repeated. You'll hear the same thing over and over again. I'm going to tell you from my perspective, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think it comes down to what makes you most confident going into a college program. Do you feel like you're too slow at reading to be able to get through college? Are you bad at taking notes? Are you worried about that? All right, well, there are classes for that. You can develop those skills. Do that. If you're not worried about those things, don't waste time on it. Spend time on things you're passionate about. And, um, you know, that, that could be easy. Of course, you can save time in college if you do that up front, right? But don't feel any pressure. I personally didn't do it. I was interested in, like I said, physics and chemistry. So I took more advanced classes on that. I didn't need them. I was just curious. So I did. Um, and I want to point out another thing. When we're talking about things that you're passionate about, uh, parents, close your ears. Sometimes video games <laughs> can actually do this for you, can, can do good things. Um, when I was in junior high and high school, uh, it was before the internet was as big and good as it is right now, but we were playing network games. We just had to, everybody goes over to somebody's basement, you take your Xbox and your Ethernet cord with you and let's hook them up and play together. And so we did a lot of these, particularly one summer, that was my whole summer, was landing. It was great. But there weren't any how-tos on how to hook these things up. Um, it was back in the day when straight through versus crossover cable was a big deal. You couldn't just plug a cable from one Xbox to the other and expect it to work unless it was the right kind. And so we learned a lot doing that. I learned a lot about Ethernet, about the difference between a router and a switch, and how to configure these things, how to troubleshoot it. And I took that process into my schooling, but really, I use that all the time, every day in my business. And I'm working as an engineer, even as used in industry. This is giving me a leg up. Again, we talk about, I talk about, you know, the guy who's done it for 50 years versus has a flexible mind. I, I'm always the person people are going to for even questions. Uh, so, 
pursue those things that, that challenge you, that make you think, that, that are exciting. Choosing a university. So again, I've got, uh, I'll just give you my perspective on this. Um, I got the, the pleasure of being able to be a part of a big university and a small university. So I did a undergraduate program at Stout. And it was a great school. I would go back, absolutely. That was a small school. Uh, so class sizes were smaller. I got to have a real relationship with all my professors and the people in my program, the small program. Uh, but the teachers weren't always experts in what they were teaching. So keep that in mind. And that's one of the reasons I chose to go to Madison for my graduate program. I wanted more high level education. Um, and in Madison, uh, especially at the undergrad level, you're probably going to have to work to have a relationship with your professor. They're probably not going to be the one I show up at the time. In a graduate setting, I had more relationship with the professors here as well, because again, it's a smaller program. It's still huge because it's mess. Something to consider. Um, something to know in engineering is that programs can be accredited or not. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the difference ABET is the organization that does the accreditation, and mostly it just means how much calculus is in your physics classes. It seems to be the difference. But if it's not accredited, you're probably going to see that it has technology in it somewhere. That's the code word for not accredited. And that's okay, you can get a lot of good jobs with that. Um, you, you can get a lot of good jobs with that, but if you want to go to grad school, or if you want to uh, be a professional engineer, get certified as an engineer, which means a lot of government jobs, uh, architectural engineers, things like that need to be certified on that. So in case you're wondering, that needs to be a very program. Employability is something you should always be looking at, whether people are telling you or not, Employability, 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 the program you're going into, the school that you're looking at. And they advertise that stuff. It's on their website. 93% of our college, college graduates go into a program related, or sorry, go into a job related to their program. That you might see things like that. 93% is pretty good. You see something like 60% maybe you want to stay away from that. Engineering, we, we tend to I think, do pretty well by getting jobs. And then tech schools are a really good thing to consider. MATC here in Madison, fantastic. Uh, you can go there for a year or two and get a lot of credits knocked out while you're local and still living with the parents, saving some money, and then go somewhere for the university. Or if really you just want to program robots for a living, you don't get a full degree for that. You can go get a two year and program robots. You could even graduate from their robotics and automation program and get a title as an engineer company. That happens. So I'm not saying it's the right thing for everybody, but it's worth consideration. And then grad school. So when I started college, I I was in a hurry. I wanted to get out in four years and start making money. And uh, things change. While I was there, I said, yeah, I want to do computer science. That added the F. Uh, and then when I was getting ready to graduate, after having a few internships, I couldn't find an internship that last summer. This is right around the time the recession had. So, okay, if the job market isn't there, and I'm enjoying school, I want to keep on learning, okay, I guess I need to get a master's degree. So that was how my thought process went. Um, I don't use it in my job, probably at all. I didn't need it to get a job. Um, in general, you could, I think when I was looking into it, it seemed like every higher degree was another 10 grand on your yearly paycheck. So that's a thing. But if you go to school too much, you get a PhD, you're not going to get the same jobs that you get with a bachelor's. You, you can actually be overqualified. So they don't want to pay you for a PhD. Or they think, oh, he would be bored in this position. Um, the last thing I want to mention on um, a graduate 
program. It was the way that I started to think about the world differently. When I did my bachelor's degree, it was about, in one sentence, it was take an equation and solve a problem. And that's very powerful. That's what engineers do. In, uh, in my master's program, it was, here's the problem, make an equation. And that's very powerful as well. That, I, I look at the world differently than I used to based on, on having to do that for two years. Find your first job. So uh, I've got a lot on this slide. I'm just going to rapid fire through it. If you guys have questions, please interrupt me. Um, we just don't have time to do a whole uh, workshop on resumes and interviews. So, uh, Again, I, I keep saying I've got different perspectives than maybe other people. Uh, resumes are no exception. You'll, you'll hear a lot of things. It has to be one page. Make sure you use Arial font. The list goes on. You've heard these. Minus two pages. I got interviews. Um, and the way I think about it is I don't expect that the person sifting through a stack of 200 resumes is going to look at the back side. No. The, the front side of that paper is to get me an interview. The back side is the script for the interview. They're going to ask questions. I'm going to say, oh, yeah, I was part of this team, and I did this project, and oh, I have an interest in bikes or whatever. Oh, so how much do you bike? OK, well, we've got things to talk about. And you can, you can plan your interview that way. Do that. Um, do take advantage of internships as much as you can. They're paid in engineering, which isn't true in every field. Um, in my internships, this is 10-ish years ago, I was paid between $16 and $20 an hour. Pretty darn good for not having a degree. Pretty darn good considering how much experience you're getting, how much resume building you're doing. So do that as much as possible. And get paid. <laughs> Why not? So one of the things I like to do that we've started doing recently in the business is making comments that make us laugh at the things that we do or that we see in the industry. So when we're having management meetings. This is something that we've started doing. That's a good time. Um, by the way, all the comics that you see in this presentation, you are the first people to see them. They're not published yet. These are new. So um, when I'm looking at at a new job, you're going to uh, you're going to graduate looking like this guy. You're going to be happy and proud. You're ready to save the world. I'm looking out for this guy when I'm interviewing. If I see a lot of that guy, no bueno. I'm not going to that job. Um, if people are bored, if people are tired, ask questions about uh, what hours are expected. If everybody works 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week. You know, ask yourself, does that fit for me? Um, look for signs of turnover. Turnover is when uh, is when people leave their job. If there's high turnover, everybody's leaving, people stay for a year and then they're gone, that's a red flag. If you walk into the department room to meet people on your tour and everybody looks like they're fresh out of college, you probably have high turnover. And there's a reason for it. You take that job, you'll find out. Something I personally found is a bad sign for me, and this is, again, it's, it's about the personality I have and how I fit in with the company, is family feel. I've worked a couple jobs where in the interview I got this feel like, oh, they feel like a family. I love that. That's awesome. And then I get there, and I find out that that's got the other half of the dysfunction. <laughs> Emotional decision-making and uh, internal politics and micromanagement. So that's a red flag for me, maybe not for you, but things to be aware of, so look for. Good signs. Are you interested in what you're going to be doing? And I want to caution you, it's a toilet paper company, and you don't find toilet paper very interesting. Know that there's a lot of interesting stuff behind it. And I can tell you, I, a brain machine has done a fair amount of work in the paper industry. There is some cool stuff going on in the paper industry. So don't turn down the toilet paper job. Yeah. 
if you're going to be the engineer, right? You're not just going to be peeling it apart and making sure it works, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making the commercial and measuring the lens, I don't know. Uh, are, are people happy? Are they proud of the work that they're doing? When you ask them questions about what they're doing, do they light up? Are they interested in it? They say, oh, here's the challenge with this thing that I'm working on. That's what I'm looking for. And last piece here, this is going to be a lifelong point for all of you, I'm sure, work-life balance. It's easy to find an engineering job where you work too much and you have to change your Facebook status to an engineering. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's cool. I would bet most of the people that work at Tesla or SpaceX don't have a whole lot of work-life balance. But they're fresh grads, they're young, they don't have families, they're just doing it. They're doing something awesome. That's exciting. You can do that for a while, and you probably can't do it forever. That's a, you know, it's not a bad thing, it's just a choice. And get conscious. Another thing to consider is engineers are usually paid salary. That means if you're working 80 hours a week, which I've done before on salary, I've done 90 hours a week on salary. No, that, <laughs> that's not sustainable. And uh, it certainly didn't make me feel appreciated. I like to be appreciated in my job. I'm not sure everybody knows what that means on salary. Salary means you get paid this much per week or month or year or whatever. And it doesn't matter how much you work or don't. So if I'm working, more than 40 hours a week, 40 is considered the norm. If I'm working 100 hours a week on that too, I'm not getting paid for it. I'm not getting paid for 60 of that 100 hours. And some companies will recognize that, but they stock options, you get bonuses. Uh, I did actually have a salary position where I was paid overtime, which is really weird. That, that was a weird bookkeeping magic that they did. Uh, but expect most places you're going to see an engineering position with salary that's a fixed pay. So if the project needs overtime, you're going to be working overtime and you're not going to be taking home any more money. Uh, hourly does exist, it's just not common. So with my company, we pay hourly because I don't really like that model. And because I know people have a life. When I started this company, I, I was thinking, I want to invent the 30 hour work week. And it's funny because I've kind of invented that for my employees when I still work too much. <laughs> so, things to learn. So, you got your school, you got your degree, you went and did some interviews, you got a job. The thing that I have found to be the biggest struggle for me, and I imagine this is probably true for a lot of engineers, is fitting into the culture. Every company has a culture, they're all different. And, uh, Sometimes there's a lot of tension. This is very common in manufacturing. Once you guys get out of the industry, I'm sure some of you are going to see this. The, the paper balls. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the internal conflict. No. <laughs> this is a caricature of a real situation. <laughs> We've got three departments here. IT is angry at manufacturing because manufacturing just lets anything be on the network. And manufacturing is angry at IT because IT keeps putting in security policies that crash the programs on the industrial equipment and they're not making product anymore. It's always this struggle. If we let out our trade secrets or if we get hacked, that's going to put us under. Well, if we don't make product, that's going to put us under. And I like to argue that this is management's job <laughs> to deal with this, and they often don't know how or don't know what they need to. But the point that I'm trying to convey here is there are tensions at work. Everybody has their own set of needs, wants, job responsibilities. And as engineers, we are stereotypically not very good at seeing that. So I'm going to challenge you folks to think about that, to know that going into it. What's going on in the other guy's mind? And that'll help you a lot. Here's another comic, another point I want to It's a PLC. A PLC is an industrial computer. So what the manager is asking here is, can't we fix 
the mechanical issue by changing program. Programmers here, you get asked that a lot. <laughs> it doesn't stop when you get out of here. <laughs> That's a forever thing. And I mean, let's be realistic, you can't get everything right on the first try. We gotta figure out ways to band-aid things with programming changes. Um, sometimes it's not realistic. And the thing I'm trying to point out here is, uh, this is an example, the thing that I found helps me a lot with fitting into a culture with uh, being a productive and happy part of the group is to try and think about the person I'm working with or working for, trying to serve them. And it's not a thing that came naturally to me at first, but it's really made me feel a lot happier and fit in a lot better. The engineer is like, dude, that's a stupid question. But the manager is trying to figure out how to do this without scrapping the whole project and redesigning it. They both have valid thoughts on this. Uh, so the engineer's job is to help the manager understand. It's not the manager's job to understand how the inner workings of the machine work. You know? Now, this engineer is obviously in a position of, uh, of some power and experience. When you start your jobs, you're not going to be in that position. You're going to be doing probably a lot of grunt work, little tasks for somebody else. That's fine, you're learning. You're getting a foothold in the company, you're developing a strategy for doing those things. Again, I would suggest, strongly suggest you think about serving. I'm serving this person. And you can actually learn faster by taking that approach. I'll give you an example. Somebody says, here, run this machine, and collect this data for me. Why do they want that data? You run that machine, you collect that data, but think about what's, what's this person really asking? He wants to know if we can make the machine run more efficiently, I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe as you're running the machine and collecting the data, you see a trend. Say, oh, let's graph that. I can pick the most efficient point on that graph. Maybe you find a question. You say, this machine might be able to do better if I do this. Okay, well, maybe you can do that and bring back the data to that guy and be like, look at this awesome thing I found. You're practicing thinking about it. And you're producing a better product in general. It's a win-win. Changing jobs is gonna happen. It used to be someone would get a job and be with that company for 20, 30 years, their whole life, and the company would take care of them, would give them you know, retirement money. Uh, this just isn't the case anymore. And this relationship is eroded from both sides. It's not like people are jaded or, or just not loyal. It's just the way it is these days. Um, this is a graph that I borrowed from this website that shows every, every little stair step there, that's somebody changing jobs and making more money. And your, your skills are gonna follow the same trend. If you stay in one job, not gonna, you, you'll have this initial big learning, which is great, and at some point it's going to taper off a little bit. It's not going to be learning as much. Probably. I hope you find a job that pushes you, challenges you, and grows you all the time. It's probably not that. So this is a way to be more, uh, more broad in your skill set. And like I said, being able to learn quickly and reapply what you're learning, this is very helpful. This is important today. And of course, you make a lot more money doing it. Many people will suggest two to three years for each job for your first 10 years. I'm not saying that's right for everybody, but it's one recommendation. And lastly, I do want to tell you, engineers are not known for their empathy and for good reason. I put a couple articles in and uh, podcast up here. I could actually write a blog post on this. I feel very strongly about it. Um, I'm not going to be able to share all those thoughts with you right now, but I bear my soul in that blog post and I've had a lot of people tell me they're recommending it to all their friends. So if you're interested, that can easily be Google or I can send you. Um, one story short, you can't think analytically and compassionately at the same time. It just doesn't work. The brain is not wired that way. Studies have shown. 
And so it takes a little bit of extra effort on your part to not be that way, to think about other people and their needs. And again, I think that's a lifelong uh, effort. Just can yeah. I add something about sure. humanity and changing jobs? Yeah. Don't burn your bridges. Yes. Because yes. It's astonishing how often you will have to deal again with the people you used to work with. So I have a really good example of that. I interviewed for a job with a very nice woman named Michelle. I work for UW Health. And I interviewed with her at Dean, which is a UW Health competitor. I ended up not taking that job. And then three or four years later, I'm interviewing Michelle because she's coming to work for UW Health now. And we remembered each other. We had a lovely experience in our first interview. So like, I didn't burn my bridges with Dean and she didn't burn her bridges with me when I turned down her job. And then I was able to give her a job like three or four years later. So just, especially if you're staying in Madison or a town this size, you're gonna know everybody in your industry after a while and people move around and change jobs. So don't burn any bridges. Agreed, 100%. And in this, with this industry especially, we've had, it's, a, it's a very small community. There aren't that many people um, in this field compared to how many you need. And so Bream Machine um, is a worldwide company. We've, we've gone to Saudi Arabia and Canada, um, are probably our two are most common ones. And, <coughs> excuse me, there are previous um, employers that, that John had worked with before we went ahead and you know, started this company and everything that now we're working with them even in these other countries. It really is a really small world within this industry. So especially here, the word gets around, the word of mouth is really, really important in this. So always having good relationships and you know making sure that everyone's at least on some, as satisfied as you can get and having some sometimes tough conversations, especially um, especially running this business has been, it's definitely a thing that we have to do. Thank you for those additions. That's very good points. I want to talk about my job now. Uh, it can be summed up in these four bullet points. Oh, it's never really that simple, right? So we do design, we do wiring of the things that we're designing, we program them, we troubleshoot them. We don't do the mechanical parts. Somebody else does those. Here's an example of some design that I might do. These drawings are made in AutoCAD. Um, we'll do schematics. This, this tells a, an electrician or me or whoever's doing the wiring how to wire it, what to label the wires, where to plug them in. Depending on how detailed you get, it could be wire color, it could be wire ratings, it could be uh, wire gauge or whatever else. Um, this is also and you'll see a picture that sort of relates to this next slide. This is a panel drawing. So it shows, in this case, a PLC and uh, some circuit breakers and a power supply, etc. in a panel. Um, so it's, this is all of the documentation that tells a person how to put something together. We also do things, spreadsheets, that have uh, a listing of every piece that goes into the machine. <clears throat> And so, again, the PLC, the circuit breakers, etc. We do all this in AutoCAD, and nobody in the industry will teach you how to do this. You just have to know. It's one of those things. Um, I learned kind of on the job, and then I refined it. I put together a whole uh, video course on this. And now, Krista does drawings as well. She's not an engineer, but she's doing drawings. So you can learn this stuff. It's, it's there. And Benton High School teaches classes on AutoCAD and other things. Oh, AutoCAD classes are common. AutoCAD for this is not common. That's the thing I struggled with when I was trying to learn. You're, you're right, they're, they're out there. But they're usually targeted at architecture. So we'll teach you how to draw toilet seats and couches, but <laughs> not schematics. So let's do a little scavenger hunt. We talked about PLCs a little bit. It's the industrial computer. Any guesses which part on here is it? This lady is helping. Send big, send big one. I hear a few guesses. Bottom right. Second one through So I hear uh, top left a few times. I heard 
top right. I heard the big one. I think that's probably the big one. Yeah. <laughs> and then I heard five on the right corner right here. Yeah. I think it's the black one. Top left, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that's the DLC. It's not the big one. It's not, not the biggest. It's, it's big ish, I guess. And all this wiring in here, most of it is inputs and outputs, switches, lights, buttons, valves. It's controlling the mission. That's what it does. Most of, of the rest of this can really be tracked up to power. We have a little bit of communication. We've got some power distribution. These are just terminal blocks to put the water stuff up. This big one that everyone's been looking at is called our EFD, Variable Frequency Drive. It just runs a motor at variable speed. So it, it takes in 60 hertz from, from the grid and it puts out 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever you decide to have. In this case, it ended went up to 120 hertz. This is a power supply. It takes the grid power and turns it into 24 volts, which is what DLC and most other little things run on. This is all circuit protection, fusing, and this is a motor drive or a DC motor. It's again very little speed, but it's, but it's not DC at this point. I could probably talk about that for a while. I'll pull myself away from it so I can show you the next thing that we talk about. One of these things is not like the other. Can you tell the difference? You took away all those nasty wires. I sure did. Well, I did this. <laughs> what else? Yeah, I put the covers on the wire duct. The cameras at a different angle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> yes. These things here, this is a PLC that's about as old as I am. And this is expansion I hope for it. We replace it. And this is a thing that we do a lot of. Most companies will try and sell a new machine a new control box with all of this stuff being new, but something that we'll do is we'll take the program out of this and we'll design a replacement, put a new program in that one, and install it. So there was a bit of wiring there. It took about a day and a half to do the installation and test everything. But uh, we have a recording of this project. going to be on YouTube really soon, so <laughs> stay posted. I'm really excited about that. This, this customer let us come in with a camera so we could show you guys. Really quick, while we're looking at this, I just wanted to notice you guys go forth into jobs and other things. One of the major feedbacks, one of the reasons that we've been asked back to some of these sites when other integrators were, were not um, is because, um, I'm sorry, Johnny, kind of OCD. But if you'll notice how clean that, that one on the right looks when we left, in this plant, there is dust flying everywhere. Like this place is, I'm pretty sure it's just a dust manufacturer. Um, <laughs> it, it's everywhere. And so we actually went in there with vacuums and wipes and wiped all those out. Went back to a, another panel that we had done um, a year or so before and cleaned that one out again. And they came back and like, oh my, thank you so much for cleaning this up. We've had you know emails and other things going, oh, this is great, you can clean up the mess. Like our guys left there. They actually see things and control things. Our, our safety people love it. You know, thanks for doing that. So as you go out to do these things, going that little bit of extra mile can really make you stand out. Being clean is a nice thing. There's a, another person we worked with that's known, also jokingly, as being uh, OCD. If everything's exact, all the labels are easy to read. Those things really matter. Those details really matter. Having uniformity from one thing to another matter a lot. People care about that. So, yeah. John, so this is a sort of way to consider entrepreneurship from a personal perspective. Every person has their own brand. People will come to know what your brand is. Do you know what it is? Is your brand friendly and personal? Is it grouchy? Is it perfection? Is it, I'm going to do it right, but I'm going to make you feel bad the whole time? <laughs> there are people that have that brand. They're not thinking about it. It's, uh, it goes along with that don't burn bridges and small world and all that stuff that we're talking about. 
So, any programmers out there uh, want to figure out the joke here? There are a couple jokes in here. <laughs> I'm not going to talk immensely about the difference in perspective uh, between what I thought I do and what I actually do and what other people think I do. I, I have struggled a lot to describe to not technical people uh, what I do in my job. And so sometimes I just say, oh, I program robots, which is true. I don't program in this robot. <laughs> I don't do incomprehensible math to make him do things. That's, but I think that's what people think of. As, so that's why even that hurts me to try and describe it that way. I thought I would be programming in text-based languages. You guys familiar with these? C, Java, whatever. This is actually more common in the industry. This is called ladder logic. It's actually a programming language that's designed to look like a wiring thing. And this is for historical reasons. People don't like change. The early PLCs were just replacing relays, and so they said, let's program it like that. People know how to do that. And here we are 40, 50 years later doing the same thing. Um, I have opinions on that, but I'm not going to share them right now. Um, I mostly just wanted to show you what that looks like. It's a graphical programming language, and that's primarily what we use for PLCs. We also program a whole bunch of other things, uh, smart cameras, robots, HMIs, human-machine interfaces, like the touchscreen you see on an industrial machine. Uh, we'll program motion, program all sorts of stuff. And so again, you have to be flexible, you have to put the right things. So who is the programming language for both PLCs? What's the, what is the language you use for the stuff you usually do? This is called ladder logic, and it's what we use in the PLCs. There is a text-based language that we use often enough, I would say maybe 10% of the time, uh, and it, it looks a little more like this. It's based on Pascal or Fortran, um, but it's an industry standard called structured text. This is another scenario that I unfortunately see every once in a while. This is like my nightmare as a troubleshooter. <laughs> These are complex systems that we work on. I have to know a handful of programming languages, a lot of little bits and pieces for electrical, pneumatics, hydraulics, mechanical linkages. I have to understand momentum and all sorts of other things to be able to troubleshoot some of these systems. And so sometimes you get there and, and you're tinkering with things in the program or the wiring or whatever, and it's like, why did it start working again? Hooray, it's working. But if I don't know why, then I don't know if it's going to come back or whatever. It's going to come back. But really, this, this is part of my job that I love. I love troubleshooting. I love the complexity. I love taking a machine and zooming in and out in my mind and flexing it to try and uh, to try and test hypotheses. Okay, we know that when we did this, it did that. We know that when we did this, it didn't do anything. Okay, let's just walk through the series of things that have to happen between here and there and take a best guess of what's wrong and then try and figure out how to test that. This, this is critical problem solving. Purely, this is a uh, Hey, John, how many times when you're asked to go out on a site, do you like walk into that going, I know exactly what to do and, and uh, how to do it? That's a good question. <laughs> Very rarely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, oftentimes I go to a job site, I don't even know if I have the right cable to connect to it. I don't know if I have the right software. I don't even know what the machine does sometimes. <laughs> they say, hey, the PLC is broken. I just need your help to fix it. Oh, OK, what kind is it? I don't know. Well, if you open up the box, what do you see? Does it say Alan Bradley or, oh, I don't know. It's, it's just got you know wires and stuff. <laughs> so I'll get there, and I'll find out there is no PLC, or it's a brand and age that nobody supports anymore. It's 40 years old. Um, and so, you know, we, we do what we can. And sometimes what we can is, well, 
But I tell you what, I can have this replaced for you. I'll rewrite your program and I'll order some parts and we'll fix it in four weeks, which is pretty amazing, by the way. Um, sometimes it's, oh, I'm just going to tweak this thing because I have a guess and it'll start working, even though I can't connect to the PLC. Uh, what's important when you walk into a situation where you don't know? You obviously got to know the fundamentals, what a program is and how it's built, even if I can't see it or don't know that language. Um, and you got to know where your resources are. I'm usually, if, if they can tell me it's this brand of PLC or it's uh, something, I'm calling around and I'm getting some phone numbers for applications engineers. I'm getting the manual, I'm getting other things. So when I go on a site, I have things to look at. When I look at my at the machine and then I have to look back at my customer and tell them what's going on. They're looking at me like I know what's going on. I have to be able to tell them something. Hey, I don't have the software for this, but I have a suspicion this will fix it. Why don't we try it? Hey, I don't have the right cable. Let me call this resource. He's going to know what to do. That's all good. And uh, sometimes I like to say in my job, I'm just about making people happy. If the machine's broken, fixing it will make them happy. Having a next step will probably make them happy too. John, I think you got a question. Oh, yeah. Of those four things, which one would you say you do the most? It's another one of those, uh, what I thought I'd be doing versus what I actually am doing. I think I do programming troubleshooting the most. If I had to pick one, I'd say probably programming. But programming and troubleshooting would be going quite often. I would like to do more electrical design, but many times just the kind of projects we get aren't that way. <clears throat> Maybe that's because we're not doing the mechanical design as well. And then uh, I'm going to say even though I don't do a ton of wiring, I like doing it. It gets me out of the desk. I get to work with my hands. This is one of the great things about engineering. If you get the right job, you can use your brain and your hands at the same time, or in the same job. It's not in the wiring, though. When, um, we don't do a lot of wiring, and part of that is because there's a lot of people in the industry. There are um, on-site um, mechanics or title changes, depending on the company. And they are usually familiar with some wiring, and it's usually cheaper for the company to pay their internal guys to run the wire, even if they may not do it 100% right, to at least do the majority of it, before they pay us to come in and, and do it. So, yeah, just thoughts. That's a good point. That guy's not always fully qualified to do it, so sometimes we end up redoing parts, but uh, it's, it's very true. It's a more common skill set, and uh, it often ends up being better fit for the customer. Let's turn to the question. I was just wondering, if, if a company can pay you to work multiple days on rewiring the panel, how much do these machines cost? Oh. <laughs> Small industrial equipment is $100,000. Big is $6 million and upward for a single machine. How big are these machines? Um, the one that I have in my head for $6 million, like fills this room. And it makes uh, reverse osmosis filtration products. Ah. Or it's one step in the process. Uh, yeah, that, I've worked on a lot of those machines. That's taken me to Saudi three times. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's a, another good example of your size. Something in the $100,000 range would probably be the size of this table here. Many of the things that we do are pieces of a machine. We'll upgrade something, we'll add a smart camera to do inspection, or uh, we'll upgrade a PLC like they showed you. So this is my last uh, my last topic, entrepreneurship. My last job working for the man. I learned a ton. I learned a lot. Um, at some point. I felt like my learning was stagnating. I really wanted to learn more. I didn't have the growth that I was looking for anymore. So I started looking for another job. And after a year of looking, I didn't find anything that, that made sense to me. And I, 
found the opportunity to make my own job, so that's what I did. And it was remarkably easy. I talked to a lawyer, I talked to an accountant, I opened a bank account, and I went online and paid $200 to register an LLC. Ta-da, I have a business. It's really that easy. Now, how do you make it profitable? I just happen to have the right contacts in the industry. I gave a few phone calls and said, hey, I'm doing this thing now. I found a few people who were in a position to benefit from what I could do for them, and so it could be a mutually beneficial relationship, and the rest is history. So, uh, coming back to Don't Burn Bridges, one of my first clients was the job that I just left. And I'm, I still can't believe I was able to pull that off that well. <laughs> because I had a lot of strong feelings as I was leaving the job, but I, I was very deliberate. I, I, I really do enjoy working with that company, so I'm glad to really work Now, growing the business, that's been a lot harder. And just having my own job, working as a contractor or one-man shop, I would call that entrepreneurship. Like, it's not really entrepreneurship. You found a niche, you made your job, okay. The thing that makes an entrepreneur is making something bigger than yourself. How do you find people and convince them to follow your cause? It's not just money. People want something to believe you. And so you have to figure out, if you own a business, what is your reason for existing? And this is an ongoing thing that I'm always thinking about and trying to refine. In the end, the thing I keep coming back to is we're here to help people. You know, when I graduated, I wanted to save the world. And I never felt like I could do that in a job, in somebody else's job. But I feel like I can do that in my job, and I do the best I can to make sure my employees feel that way also. I want my company to be about that. Something I was surprised about, and it's probably related to this reason for existing, is doing the same work. I had so much more satisfaction doing it for me than I did for anybody else. I, I'm not sure why exactly, but. You know, when someone's having a problem with their machine and they call me and I come in and I'm the hero, I just do what I do. I I love working with them. They're smiling and happy to see me. Like, wouldn't everybody want that? To, to be loved and appreciated in your job. Um, and the last thing that the business has really given me is the freedom to try new things. And sometimes that's simple things like the cartoons you've seen in the presentation. Sometimes it's, uh, I, I taught a couple semesters in tech school as part of my business. Couldn't have done that in another job. Um, we've spent a ton of time learning how to market this idea of, of, of the, the save the world behind what we're doing, you know? Trying to introduce ourselves to new people. And um, so I'm, I am a millennial as far as the dates go. Uh, I don't particularly like social media, so it's been a little bit of a challenge. But again, this is growth. It, it, it pushes me to grow and do better, to be bigger than I was. And uh, for me, that's very bad. And how, how big is your company? It's five people. It feels big. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we're a real company now. <laughs> On that note, um, working for this company versus um, any other company I've worked for, you'd be hard pressed to find a job I have not had. That's true. Um, is that, you know, really cold days because we live in Wisconsin? Um, I get to get up and I can go to work in my pajamas down the hall from where I woke up from. <laughs> well, customer Appreciation Day involves me filling coolers full of beer. And it's great. It's wonderful. So I just, when you think of like that dream job or those fantasy jobs that I think, um, at least when I was younger, the adults were like, oh, you can't do that. Nobody's going to pay you to do that. You can't do that on the job. Wouldn't let anyone put those limits or anything. Like you can, you can be your own boss. You can have fun. And you can have a lot of flexibility on these things you do. And you can do it even with existing jobs. Um, so I encourage you to go forth and you go to negotiate jobs in the future to negotiate more flexibility and be able to do that enjoyment of what you're doing. Because you'll be the best worker if you're enjoying what you're doing. My previous job said, absolutely, we'll never let you work out of the office. Two minutes in, I work primarily remotely. I live 
15 minutes away, so it wasn't a huge commute, but it was just got so much more work done. It was way more satisfactory. I enjoyed everything I did so much better. Um, still not as good as almost always being in my pajamas or, you know, beer in the patio type of stuff. But, um, yeah, if you see something, you see a life or something like that that you want or some part of it you enjoy, I would encourage you to try not to compromise on it or keep pushing to negotiate to have that as part of your current job or starting your own business and making that a part of your model, your ideals. So. And uh, I'm not trying to push people into entrepreneurship. It's worked out well for me, but uh, it's not for everybody. That's uh, meant to say that earlier. Uh, generally, people who enjoy being an employee don't want to be entrepreneurs. So consider that as you start your first job. If you're enjoying that, do that. Do what you're enjoying. Like I said, I, I wanted to invent the 30 hour work week. I ended up inventing that for my employees, but not for myself. I work a lot. Uh, uh, I mean, I love what I do. Other questions before I ask you guys to give me a tour of your robots? I do have one last question. Sure. When you're not working, what do you like to do? <laughs> I like to engineer biological systems in my yard. <laughs> it's gardening. gardening yeah. But it's not normal gardening. Science garden. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. You're also adopted by an alpaca who now lives in your garden. Yeah, so. <laughs> I've been adopted by an alpaca who lives in my garden. He ate all of my eggplants. <laughs>